Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. And folks, I always start, as you know, I've got my hat today, as, as usual. And the whole purpose of my wearing this particular hat is the fact that uh, uh, because I'm a former Marine and, and because I'm a vet and I'm a Vietnam vet, I'm always trying to reach out to my brothers and sisters out there who, who have issues um, with reference to PTSD and other issues uh, that they are, they've been, been exposed to. And the, the point that, that I'm making is always to go to the VA, get your VA card, and get the services that are available at the VA. Very, very important. So if you've got loved ones, uh, uh, whether your mom or, or, or dads or whatever, uh, encourage, encourage them. Ask them the question of whether or not they've gone to the VA and gotten their card and take advantage of those services because we do have a very serious problem. I mean, I was a Vietnam ever, ever uh, veteran. But uh, the, the Iraqi folks and, and Afghanistan folks, a lot of these young people were manned and this, that, and the other. And it's a whole different style. And they've got more of a problem as far as PTSD and issues of that nature than anyone else. So I would encourage you to get involved. And again, thanks for serving for those individuals that are looking. And I've got my, my guest today just happens to be a, a vet himself. Uh, I'm talking about this gentleman by the name of uh, Fred Stewart. Fred is here with me. He's, you've seen him on the show before. But uh, he's a former Marine. And uh, he's a he's a businessman. He's been a businessman for as, as long as I've known him. And he's got some major expertise and background because he sold probably he's probably sold more properties in the northeast corridor of, of the city of Portland than anybody that I know of. He's been very heavily involved in better, so he knows the lay of the land and whatever he was born and raised here. And uh, so he's got he's got roots here and this that and the other. Well, he's kind of like all of a sudden he's taking a, he's taking the initiative, if you will, to to jump in the in the race here for city council and try to respond to issues, there's some very serious issues that are relative to the uh, the northeast corridor. He happens to be a black man. He has he has respect to that. He happens to be an American, but he knows that he's going, he wants to take on a responsibility that no one is ignoring, if you will. We got to solve the problem. Our youth are having some tough times. Our education system here within this particular community has some tough times. Uh, housing has some tough time. We got the whole issue of gentrification and nobody's saying anything about it uh, in many ways. But the only thing they've, they've seen is that people have been moving out and whatever. There are causes all over the place. But there are other issues too. There's transportation issues. There's, there's concerns about folks just riding their bicycles and, and dealing with the streets and whatever and, and paying more taxes and there's a whole bunch of things. So it's not just a matter of just focusing on African-American or black American issues uh, here in the Portland metro area. It's, there are city issues too. So he's carrying quite a burden, if you will, quite a burden. So we want to welcome, we want to welcome Fred here today. And, and uh, I, for one, I really appreciate the fact that he's going to be running for office because I don't know of anyone and sit, sitting on city council today uh, that has the background that he has, but also, uh, and, and also has the background in the issues that we are we are really really concerned about, and um, so I want to welcome you, Fred. Thank you, and thank you very much, for running buddy. And thank you. Now I'll, I'll be able to make the other statement. Thanks for serving, which <laughs> <laughs> while you're running or whatever. So did I did I say it all in regards to your yeah. background and this that and the other, and uh, so you know, Fred. I'm, if you don't mind, I'm just going to kind of force an issue on the table because I know you got a lot of things going, and we don't, we have so, uh, and we're going to have you on as as often as we possibly can. But I think the the the, the issue that that is of major concern to not only to this country, but throughout these United States at this point in time, and and or if not in the state or in the city for that matter, is the whole issue of Black Lives Matter. I mean, it, it's sitting on the front page of everything. I, I watched all the shows this morning on Meet the Press. I mean, the whole nine yard, and uh, it's it's there all last week in the newspapers and the whole line there. People are trying to figure out what is the definition of Black Lives Matter, if you will. And uh, I'll start off by saying it's a brand. It's, all, it's almost like the Republican brand or the, the Democratic brand or this, that, and the other. And then people have their own different ways of doing different things. But um, I want to, I'd like for us to chat about that and I'd like to get your full view of what you feel and what your rationale 
for, 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 for getting involved in, the, in that issue. Because I tell you, that's one of the issues that I really feel comfortable in saying thank you very much for serving uh, on that particular issue because you know the terrain. And I'm talking about Portland, Oregon. That's where I'm at. Go for well, it. Black Lives Matter is a national brand. It's not just a brand here in Portland, Oregon. Um, as a national brand, the first I heard of it, um, and I think when it initially started was uh, in response to the um, George Zimmerman murder of Tra uh, Trayvon Martin. Right, right. And then, uh, you know, we've had several incidences from there, and it's just grown. Um, and I support it, in theory, from that standpoint, because in this country, when it's been this way 300 years. Yeah. When a white person kills a black person, there is less interest in, in, in making sure there's justice. Uh, matter of fact, when, anytime a black person is killed, even if a black person yeah, kills right, a black right. person, there's not as big a, it, it, an issue of making sure there's justice. Um, I just wish the brand included the black on black crime mm -hmm. um, that we've suffered for the last 35 years. Um, and, you know, in this country, more black people are killed every year every year than all of the black people killed by racist white cops mm. for the last 150 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we literally are murdering that many black people mm -hmm. per year with inside the community. So I'm all for going after bad cops and mm -hmm. a racist cop is a bad cop. Mm -hmm. A racist person is not ever going to be a good public servant. How do you think we got there? What, 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 you said, when did it happen? And why, why do you think it? What, 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 how did we got get where? This whole issue of um, black people, black on black. People. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember when I was coming up, it was a, that issue was not an issue. It, I, you know, I think it's a reflection of the true breakdown in the, in the black community. I think a lot of black people, black young men, have given up. They have given up and decided that a life of crime is not just going to be something they're going to do to survive, but that is going to be their career. You know, back in the old days when guys were hustlers, it was a survival tool. It was, it was, even though it may have ended up being their career, they always looked at it as a, a survival phase in life. I'm trying to, to do this so I can feed myself, so I can put a roof over my house, because they were, um, you know, facing more racism today than you and I will ever know. Yeah, but even then, but today, I, I'm, a we've got, older, we've but I'm got, a little older than you are, mm -hmm. but the bottom line is that we had family during that particular time. You know, we, we had did. the so-called... Well, they village, have family, too. But we had the village, but then, but then all of a sudden, we went through this transition of babies having babies. Well, you know, there's going to be a tipping point. You know, once a certain number of black people have been killed in the community, right. that community is going to break down because people are not going to get along. Like I've told the people up until yesterday, literally yesterday, the family of the man that tried to kill my brother, mm -hmm. I will just say there's been nothing but hate from my end of the field to their end of the field. So that's how you got that. that no, no, I'm just saying, I think, I tell everybody, if somebody killed your son, your daughter, your wife, your husband, who it can, is, uh, it can, can be killed in your family in which you will then turn around and want to work with or live next to the person or the person's family that killed him. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's stupid to think in Portland that we can have over 500 black people killed and then have a village, as they call it, mm -hmm. a black community working together. You know, like I told the, you know, the family yesterday when we were, if you want to call it making amends, you know, I mean, they didn't, they didn't kill my brother. Their, their son, husband, they, they didn't kill my brother, but they came close. And that's all I needed. And I've hated that family since 1988, really? everybody, everybody, um, so mom, you, you, you dad, the wife, their kids. I don't like their pets, but you know, just the thought of somebody wanting to do something like that to somebody that I care about, you know, it's not, I'm not going to work with them. We're not going to do neighborhood meetings. There's no kumbaya. Well, I tell everybody, that's the problem with all the black on black killings. We've got a lot of internal well, feuds how, in our community with that based issue? on murders. Did you come to grip with that situation? With yeah, you know, it's been a long time coming. You know, I got a mother that's always doing this, you know, Bible stuff. And I got friends that are always saying, you know, you got to bury it. And honestly, the, the, you know, they're right. You know, I'm not 100% there yet, but I've, I've, I'm a long ways from where I was at January 1st of this year. Mm -hmm. I'm a long ways. Because 
you know, how I feel is one of the is in, is indicative to the problems that we got in the black community. I mean, I didn't even lose a relative. I just came close. I can't imagine. Can you imagine how a guy like me would be if they had been successful? Oh, my God. And it was over such a trivial thing. All of these murders in the gang community, when you sit down and, and find out what it was over, it's all trivial. You understand? So imagine the mothers and the fathers and their brothers and sisters out there in the black community, a small community of about 30,000 people. How are they going to work with the people, the families, the people who've killed people in their family? Every time there's a murder in the black community, that's a new family feud. Hmm. Every single time. You know, and but the brand we're talking about today is Black Lives Matter. Well, we I mean, want black. One, how does it relate? We want in and, Oregon Black Lives Matter to spend a year a focusing year. a year, the next year focusing on eliminating black on black murders. Where should it start at first? Should it start in the quote white community or the black community? Well, you know, it should start should at both go? because I got to tell you, the white people aren't off the hook on this. Okay, our white leadership, okay, all of them. Ted Wheeler, Kate Brown, all of them. All of the most powerful white people that we voted for that we like. I like a lot of these people. You know, I... I but what about city council? But hold it. You they've mention, allowed... You didn't mention the city council. Well, all, they're included. They've allowed the, the this genocide of black people killing black people for the last 27 years. Hmm. Every white politician that we like, and the more powerful they are... The more influential they are, the more black blood they have on their hands. We don't have that many black people in, in politics in Oregon, elected politics. But wait, we wait, don't wait, have how, that many well, major Fred, decision Fred, makers. Wait a minute. How, why, how and why would you associate, if you will, mm -hmm. the fact that they're, they're, they're responsible, the, the so-called elected Because leaders. I think a lot of them don't have what we call, what I would call, meaningful connections or relationships with the black community. A lot of them don't look at black people black people like me as part of their community, let alone our children. So when they read in the paper about a young black kid, 16, 17 years old, shooting another black kid, that's not anybody they have a connection to. It's not like somebody in their neighborhood or somebody they grew up with. You know, I grew up here in Portland. I got a daughter. I got friends that when they think of my daughter, they think of her almost as if they're part of the family. You understand? I don't think there's very many of those type of relationships among the body of our most powerful white politicians in the state. Well, now you made mention about the fact you, that there are black leaders. You know, you've got you've not got, many. You've got you've got in, in this particular community, you got a Lou Frederick. He's a he's a legislator, right? A representative. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, Loretta Smith, who happens to be a county commissioner. Correct. That represents this particular area. Correct. Okay, that's fair. Okay, and then you got the other i.e. leadership, if you will. You've got Sam Brooks, you've got Roy J., you've got the publishers of the Observer newspaper, the publisher of the Scanner newspaper. Yeah. I can, you know, there's things, a long list. Of things certainly lives. started getting better when Lou Frederick became an elected official and when Loretta Smith became an elected official. Okay. Things started getting a little better by that much. They're only two people. Thank right, God for them. Yep, I'm yep. not, you know, I'm not hating that they're that they're there. Okay. But there's just two people. I mean, uh, Loretta still has to have that talk with Deborah and the other people on on, on county council. Um, Deborah Kafori. Deborah Kafori, uh, about this and get them to go their way. I mean, Deborah and those girls. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Jules Bailey. Now, they've got a prison that they won't work use right now. That prison should be used for something to protect mm -hmm. the citizens of Portland. You know. It would be interesting if you know, Deborah would call the sheriff and said, Sheriff, I'm going to open up this prison somehow, some way, so you can put violent black criminals in prison and protect the black community. But, you know, Deborah won't do that until a white person calls her after one of these black kids has accidentally killed their kid. Well, let's hold off now. <laughs> now let's hold off. Now, in all due respect, they were, Deborah just recently appointed Modica who's a former Portland police officer, to be I.E. an advisor there at the county. Well, you know, I got a lot, of faith, I got a lot way, of faith in, uh, in I might, Modica. I might tell Modica, congratulations, he just got married, too, I guess, yeah. the other day. No, I got a lot of faith. Modica's a very good cop. He's a very good man. That's a good move. But, you know, that's just one step. The bottom line is we got to get the violent offenders, the people that murder people, the people that try to murder people, we got to get them off the street. They've got to know they're going to come off the street. We've got to make it pe where people feel comfortable with snitching. You understand? 
people do not feel the Rod Underhills, the Deborah Kafouris, the um, Charlie Haleses of Portland are going to protect them enough to where they're going to cooperate with the police. You understand? Because these three very powerful people in our community, and they're good people, folks. They are. That's why I'm talking like this. I'm hoping you sit down and have a talk with them. It's more important that the white people out there listening to me talk to them about this than the black people, because honestly, there's not enough black people mm -hmm. for, uh, yeah. uh, out there for us to influence them. It takes more than just one relationship. But they are not doing enough to protect the black community. And what I tell all my friends, all, as often as I can when we talk about this, one day, these violent offenders, these little terrorists, they're going to make a mistake and start killing white children. Mm. Okay? Mm. It's going to happen. Mm. And maybe your child. Mm -hmm. It may be your nephew or your niece. But one day, it's going to happen. And I want you to ask yourself how you're going to feel. Are you going to feel like the black community feels when their kids get killed? Or are you going to be more angry? Bottom line, we got to nip this in the bud today. And, you know, I'm not saying ignore bad cops. But, you know, since 1980, we have not had 30 black people shot by a cop, let alone murdered by a cop. We're talking about shot. And I'm telling you, only two of those, 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 those incidences, in my personal opinion, are sketchy. I would call murders. The rest of them, they were, they were criminals. Okay, they were criminals, and they were doing what criminals do. But we've had over 500 black men and women, young black men and women, killed since August 18th, 1988, hmm. by other black people. Which is the biggest threat in the Portland, Oregon, to black folks? Um, a, even a racist white cop in the Portland police is not as much threat as a black person next door. <laughs> if you look at it, statistically, statistically, the odds of a black person that we know getting shot, let alone killed by a, a Portland cop, is pretty remote. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, that's a good reason to go march if you're a scaredy cat, uh, because they're not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. But how many people are out marching against the gangs and their families? We know where they live. We know where their fathers live and where their fathers work. How come we're not hearing stories of Black Lives Matter showing up at the homes of gang members and saying, leave our community? Hmm. Why aren't we hearing about Black Lives Matter educating community people on how to sue landlords who continuously will rent to known gang members? You understand, I mean, how many people in Portland do we need to have killed that aren't black before people really start caring? I care already. I care already. Well, let's put it this way. Let's put it this way then. Okay, now you're running for city council. Are you going to carry that same message, that platform, once the, elected? The message I'm going to carry is, is the city government should protect all citizens. I'm, a, I'm against all violent offenders. Okay, I'm dealing with this Black Lives Matter issue because that's the issue at hand. Right. But make no mistake, all violent offenders, I feel this, the, the government is duty-bound to protect mm -hmm. citizens from, period. They err on the side of caution of the innocent. And the innocent are people who do not go out and draw blood or rape or molest anybody. Um, when a government doesn't protect the citizenry from violent people, mm -hmm. it has failed. The, it's, it's in, it, the, it, the entire reason why it exists. So the message I will be taking is always to protect the city. Okay, well, on that okay. particular note then, okay, now you're sitting on city on city council, if you will. Uh, either Ted Wheeler or Charlie Hill is going get, to get, get elected mm -hmm. for mayor of the city of Portland. Would you accept, if you will, the police bureau? I would love it. I'm going to ask okay. for it. Okay. I'm going to ask for the police bureau. I'm also going to ask the city of Portland to create uh, the Bureau of, of Portland Youth Authority. Well, let's talk about the bureau. The, let's talk about the police. That's a big job. I mean, my point: if you could solve that problem, I mean, citizens in Portland and this country, for that matter, mm -hmm. would probably come over here and look at you as a model. Well, no, I, I, I feel. Let's talk a little bit about police. How would you relate to police on this issue? Well, being a former Marine, I think I would relate very well. Being somebody who's from the community, I would relate very well. I'm, I would be more comfortable with setting goals that I think are more in line with how people. Um, view their police department. I do feel personally there needs to be a change in how the Portland police approaches the public. Mm -hmm. We are dealing with the Portland, uh, a, a, an organization that was created over 100 years ago to deal with basically thugs. Mm -hmm. You understand? So we need to change what we expect out of the police and how the police um, approaches its citizens. 
You know, Fred, in all due respect, I think that one of the things I think that's causing a confusion in the whole issue of, of, of police, in all due respect, they, sh they really are law enforcement officers. Correct. And the way the process works is that uh, we, the people, if you will, are really in charge. And then we, i.e., we vote on vote on elect someone to be our super, be our responsible in agent, if you will. And so the bottom line, there we create the laws, and then the idea is that it goes to the police department, and they are trained to respond to get training, if you will, mm -hmm. on those laws, and then implement that. But but in all due respect, what do you think about that? Should they well, be Bruce, called police, or should they be called law enforcement officers? What you do you know, think about that? to me, they're interchangeable. But law enforcement, you know, is probably more accurate. But I could call I call, I call my. I got a lot of friends that are cops. I call them cops. I call, you know, that's just me. But there's a but, confusion, though. But see, you, you, you're familiar but, with But you've got to remember, it's more than just law enforcement. Go ahead. Okay, because since we created the Portland Police Department, right. uh, the legislature and the city and the county, they've put probably 20,000 laws in the books that cops 115 years ago didn't have to deal with. We expect more out of cops. we got to deal well, with... That's the job. That's what they're getting paid I, for. I understand. But we need, to, we, we need to change how... Our law enforcement is doing that job so they can do it more effectively. Okay, okay. okay. Who, who's responsible for that? The, uh, well, ultimately, the, the police commissioner and the city council. The city council. I mean, Correct. You, you, you basically have to inform the voter in terms Correct. of, hey, what the, do, does these laws apply? And they need they need to be trained also, too, and educated. Correct. They're not spending enough time educating those folks. Correct. But you've got to have leaders that are interested in what the community needs at any given time. Okay. You know, the, you know law enforcement changes what the community needs. Uh, changes, threats change. I mean, gosh, you know, when the Portland police was first created, their biggest thing they had to do was clean out the bars and make sure the prostitutes stayed in Chinatown. You know, we got a lot more issues they, than that but, today. But they were still law enforcement officers. They're right? still law okay, enforcement okay. officers. So, but but the, but today's criteria is that they feel, in all due respect, nobody's got their back. They don't. And they got a union right now. Does that, how do you feel about that union situation? Do you feel because that's why they've got it? They basically protect themselves. Well, there needs to be a, you know, look. There needs to be change with the, with the police union too. But you you need change with the representatives of the people as well. You understand? I mean, right now, our 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 city council and our 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 union is in a war footing, and nothing is going to be resolved in that. Nothing's going to be resolved. Right now, the message of community service and being a public servant isn't being expressed from either side. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe both sides want to, but they're too busy throwing darts at each other. You know, there's you know, got to be a change. The people, the people are frustrated because we're paying. Oh yeah, the people are, we're, we're are frustrated. paying for that service. You, you they do. Are, they are. That. So we're going to be looking at you. They are. From the standpoint but think about it from a cop standpoint. I don't know too many cops that are happy about the level of violence in this town, but the people that they work with, the DA's office, the county commission, the state legislature, they're not giving them the tools to fight it. Yeah, but it still has to come from the people through the mayor. Through Correct, the city, and city that's why I'm talking like this. You guys got a job. It's a job I, you got to do. I can't, t I can't express enough how important it is in this election cycle. Right, especially with Ted Wheeler running and and uh, and Charlie Hale running for re-election, um, the election that I'm in, that the city of Portland starts hearing white people speak up about their expectation that the level of violence drops. That it stops. The killing stops. Well, blacks are concerns too. You blacks say? are concerns too. But the thing is, if we are all a village, see, I grew up in, in Portland, feeling the entire city of Portland was my village. Right. Okay. I mean, I'm part of the black community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Portland is my hometown. Yeah. And I think in order for black kids to start feeling that way, it's going to be important for young black kids, young black people, to start hearing white people act like that. You know what I mean? Th th that their lives matter. It's not so much what the police feel right now. We need to hear the, the city say that. Mm. Trust me, our public servants are going to respond. Are you going to get them motivated enough to hear you on, on city council? Are you going to be able to get the vote to do the job if, in fact, you've got the, uh, uh, the, the police? Me and everybody that's working on my campaign, we're going to be working our behinds off to earn that opportunity, to earn that right. I mean, be a city commissioner, to be a public servant in this town is a uh, honor and a luxury. It is not something that you just get. Hey, look. I know we, we've already gone about 24 minutes at this point in time, but you, you, there are other areas that I'm your expertise at, and as, as from the standpoint, your real estate and, your, mm -hmm. and business aspect of it. You know, we got transportation issues right now. Mm -hmm. We got the education system, Portland Public Schools is really, I mean, they really let us down. There's no voc ed, if, if you know, in the, in the school system, because mm -hmm. I think that could help quite a bit aspect of it. Just chat a little bit about the, maybe some of the other interests, if you will, and from running as far as your platform is concerned. Well, I want, 
transportation? Well, well transportation, you know, uh, the city council needs to just stop avoiding what we have to do when it comes to uh, um, paving roads, in, both in southwest Portland, north and, and northeast Portland, so, outer southeast Portland. It needs to at least start, they can pave a mile or two a year. I mean, if we can't pave at all, they could do something. We could use paving these roads as an opportunity to get more people, you know, employed in this town, especially minorities. You know, up, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't have a single black uh, general contractor in the state of Oregon. Now I think we've got three. And they still do about one-tenth of the work that, you know, the uh, average white general contractor does. This is a great opportunity for the city to work with minority businesses and develop an opportunity to, to, to get more minorities in, in, you know, working. That alone may help lower the level of violence in the city of Portland, paving our streets. Now, now you do recognize that people still feel that affirmative action did work. It's not working. Well, what, what, what are you going to do to fix it? Well, it worked with me, gee whiz. It worked okay. with me. It worked with a lot of people. It didn't work as well as it should have, and that's a lot of it because of leaders that were both elected and, and self-appointed black leaders. I mean, I'm not even going to get into yeah. how many black people time. that we've had in the last 35 years you know, traipsed through Portland, Oregon, who have failed everybody. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm not even going to mention their names or anything like that, but I'm not going to fail everybody. I'm not going to fail anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we look at the, the, the opportunity we've got right now with the city that we've got right now, there are a lot of issues that we've got in, interculturally that we could start on the path to settle. Mm -hmm. A lot of things with the roads that have been pushed to the side, we could start to settle. You know, the thing is, we, we just need people who are interested in getting the work done. Mm -hmm. And right now, we don't. You know, the people that I'm going to be facing are going to be the people who are, are supporting somebody who enjoys being an elected official, but does not enjoy um, doing the work. You know, one, one thing I think a, a viewing artist would like to hear a little bit about and it's, it's somewhat history, but the Trader Joe's situation, remember mm -hmm. the, the MLK aspect, that was it, MLK oh, yeah. in Alberta, right? I'm still verbally abusing yeah. the people who oh, got in the way of that to this day. What happened to that, Fred? Well, that was a classic case of racism. PDC, basically with some white Port, people Portland behind them, right? Portland Development Commission, in cahoots with a, 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 a white real estate firm that I'm not going to mention because I'm going to slap them around if I win, <laughs> um, tried to steal that away from Ray Leary, and they succeeded. And while they did that, uh, some black leaders... He's a that black we, developer. Black he's a developer. black developer. Ray Leary, if it wasn't for Ray Leary, there wouldn't be a Mississippi district. There wouldn't be an Gina, Alberta Gina street. Gina Woolley was involved in that. Gina Woolley was involved in that. Right. Um, Chad, they they literally, the two of them... Are, have helped change the entire face of inner north and so northern Portland. Well, you know, some black leaders tried to come in and steal uh, the project, you know, from, from them, from the white people that stole it from them. Okay. Bottom line, it was racism that started it, and it was racism that that, that screwed everything up. And you know, the the sad part about it is that was could have been one of the best yeah, stories the better, the better in story portland too. history yeah. white people from northeast portland working with black people from northeast portland to bring trader joe's together that'd be awesome. oh my god right. that'd be you nice. know the fact that our city council couldn't see the beauty in that and let the scoundrels screw it up you know just, just like i said people th we've got a great opportunity to, to resolve a lot of issues in our in our city we are right there on the edge okay. we just need people who are willing to do the work okay well hey look as you can see folks um fred has got a lot more to say we're going to have him on and i've uh, i've also said to uh, uh to the incumbent um, city council that he's invited to come to the show i mean just come you know but um, he hasn't responded to me yet i don't know why but he hasn't responded to me well yet. i hope steve but, does yeah, you know, i hope uh, steve, i mean it would maybe be great you guys can get together if steve comes to your show steve. give him at least an hour steve i'm looking forward to running against steve i got a lot of respect for steve good, good. and one of the reasons why i'm so disappointed in him is because i got a lot of respect for him okay <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're gonna, again, Fred's going to be back. Steve, you're invited. Come on over, baby. Let's hear what you got to say. But make sure you bring some meat. Because that's really what we're all about now. We've got to solve some problems here in the city of Portland. we got problems here, okay? Well, hey, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be, we'll be right back. Okay, Fred? Thanks. thanks, buddy. Thank you. Good job. Good job. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
All right, folks, it's voting time now. As you can see, boy, we're gearing up here. We're going to have all kinds of folks here on the table. We're going to be edu educating you about who you want to hire this next time around. I mean, hire meaning that you've got to vote them in one way or the other. So the bottom line is that you've got to get out there and vote. And then there are efforts, there are all sorts of efforts in talking about the whole issue of voting. Who should be allowed to vote and who shouldn't? Uh, we've got we got some other major issues, if you will, on the whole issue of immigration. We got this we got this uh, voter uh, was it motor voter kind of a thing going on right now. So my point is that there's all kinds of things out there. But the bottom line, at the end of the day, when it's time to vote, we want to make sure that the, we got citizens of this country that are, 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 are el the ones who are eligible, if you will, to vote. Well, guess what we're going to do? There's a there's a petition out in the air right now, and that's what my guest is going to be talking about at this point in time: proof of qualifications of e of the electors. Are you qualified to vote? Fair? Right. The okay, and I got Janice here. Janice, Janice Dissinger, she's one of the uh, petitioners, right? No, I'm, I'm, I'm working with are, the petitioners. You're working with the petitioners, right? Mm -hmm. And then that's, that's, in fact, what, if you don't mind, Janice, why don't you mention one who the petitioners are and then define what we're talking about here for Okay, us. Mike Neerman, who's a state representative from uh, Polk County, and uh, James Bucall, who's a local attorney, are the chief petitioners for this uh, initiative. And this initiative just requires proof for what the Constitution already requires of the electors. So the our Oregon Constitution says you must be a citizen of the, of the United States and you must be six, at least uh, 18 years of age and um, the United States citizens uh, and a resident of the state. Okay. So those are the three requirements. So we're just asking that people prove that they're a citizen of the United States in order to register. Well, aren't they here. doing that already? They are not. There are 14,000 people that are in in Oregon that have registered to vote that have given zero evidence of anything. And we found through an investigation that a dog and a cat were both registered to vote. So that doesn't leave us very well. I mean, protected. all this time we've been voting? I mean, Mickey Mouse been running? That's how you get cartoon characters Gee. registered to vote. And we just, we just like to know that all of our votes count yeah. equally. And so we want some evidence that uh, the people that voting are eligible to vote here. But why so long? I mean, they, they should have cleaned this up a long mm -hmm. time ago. Well, I've working, I've been working a long time with the legislature and Kim Thatcher every year proposes. And Kim, she's a, re she's a representative too. Uh, right. And she proposes every year the, uh, a ballot, um, a, a bill that would uh, ask people to give some kind of ID that they are registered uh, at, legally. So... Hmm. It, What's the problem? The, it's not going to happen in the legislature. The legislature is not kind towards this, and the Secretary of State didn't push it. So I think the only way we're going to get anything uh, in action is to do it as an initiative. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's go back a moment. You said Secretary of State. I'm, I'm very familiar with a Secretary of State that's now governor of this state. Kate Brown, mm -hmm. and she was Secretary of State. Was, right. Was a, is, what's the problem there? Well, you know, I, I investigating over the years, um, I found um, just recently, uh, uh, I have a letter here from Sal Esquivel to the Elections Department, and he uh, got a response back from Jim Williams, who's the Elections Director, mm -hmm. and he gave a step-by-step -step procedure of how the Secretary of State checks with DMV on, on if a person is eligible to vote. So they're saying, they're, they're inquiring, of the Secretary of State's office is inquiring of the elections office, but all they're getting back is um, that the person has a driver's license. Well, if you're here legally from another country, you can get a driver's license while you're here for the length of your visa. Hmm. And, and, but all the, their check was showing is that the person had a driver's license and so somebody could go and fill out a paper ballot uh, a, a paper registration that they are and say they're a citizen mm -hmm. and didn't have to give any proof they could put down the Oregon driver's license and we know people from other countries get social security numbers they can put that down it'll go in and when the Secretary of State's office or the county clerk checks with DMV it'll come back as a valid driver's license and so there's no check to disc um, to uh, stop that um, voter from voting. So they'll get a ballot just like you will and just like I will, mm -hmm. and they'll be able to vote in our elections. And I just don't think that's right. And we also found out when people register from overseas that the HAVA laws, the Help America Vote Act, um, that that excludes that voter that registering 
from overseas, mm -hmm. uh, from any of the checks from the Haba. So they don't have to offer any proof of citizenship either. So when they when they go in and they fill out their form online for the federal postcard application, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the part where you put in your driver's license and your social security number, it asks for them and it says that you must have them. But if you go look at the instructions for that document, it says if you don't have those documents, just skip it and we'll assign a number for you. Mm -hmm. So there's actually, you can register from anywhere in the world in Oregon's elections and offer zero proof and you'll get a ballot from is that now on. Is that exist in other states? In the, in the uh, it does exist in other states. There are some states like uh, Kansas and Arizona, I think Alabama, there's a few others now that have said they want to have some proof of U.S. citizenship and that's gone before the courts and um, we're still in the process that it's in one court will kick it down another court will uphold it so these those particular states are saying we want proof of citizenship and so if somebody uses the federal postcard application they they have to know in the instructions they have to send in proof of citizenship so um, that's still being debated and I uh, the I believe the Supreme Court will eventually uh, uphold the view that you need to be a citizen in order to register to vote hmm. because they've always given that that's part of the constitution that is delegated to the mm -hmm. state on how they they uh, um, um, work that out so you know I was I was looking at the two people that that are the um, uh, the initiative basically the site of the, the initiative petition the petitioners James Buchel who was a, he was a former candidate if you will mm -hmm. against Attorney Earl General. Blumenauer yeah Earl Blumenauer and then you got Michael Nierman who was a, a sitting Represented mm -hmm. at this point in time, so these are, these are people that are very knowledgeable, right? They and are familiar with the problem, if mm -hmm. you will, in this issue. And uh, well, well, how, how did I, I'm I'm still sort of puzzled. One, you mentioned the Department of uh, the DMV, mm -hmm. Department of Motor Vehicle. One, who's that boss? I don't know. Is who that is the governor? The, is that the governor's office? Uh, I'm I'm afraid what I, I don't know. Okay, who's okay, the, but something has got to be a boss. I mean, we, we do elect a governor, right? Yeah, no problem. And then we got Secretary of State, but still, at the end of the day, it's still the governor. Just like I was talking to Fred mm -hmm. about the mayor, right? Mm -hmm. And that that situation has been governor. But I mean, why is it taking this long to to get to the point where, where it's a big work to take on doing a, an initiative petition? We tried working several times through the legislature, and it just didn't get us anywhere. And so I, I've just come to the conclusion that the only way we'll get any results is mm -hmm. if we do it as citizens. What was their rationale for saying no? We're not interested in this. And is there was there anything that that you learned as you well, were trying to put this Well, I posted online together? the the um, the letter from. James, uh, uh, Jim Williams, that he wrote to the secretary, of, uh, that he wrote to Sal Esquivel, and if you go to scrib.com forward uh -huh. slash Janice Dysinger, which is my okay. my part there, and you and you look for the letter from Jim Williams, you'll see that. Um, now, who's Jim? Which one is Jim? That's not Michael. No, he, Jim Williams is the state director for well, state the elect, director. for the for elections election. division. Okay, 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 very familiar. Okay, he's a very nice man. Okay, okay, and what did he say? This letter. Well, in the letter, he said basically, there's a whole we 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 um, we put notes in the DMV about people who are not citizens, but they could become they could be in the process of becoming a citizen. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to exclude them because they they could become a citizen, mm -hmm. and we don't want to disenfranchise those new citizens. So we're not going to disqualify them. And um, if they are a citizen, of course, then they should be registered to vote. And if, um, let's see, if they haven't renewed their license yet, well, they might be a citizen, they might not be, but we don't want to exclude anybody, so we're not going to exclude anybody. So basically, in the letter, it's saying we're not going to exclude anybody mm -hmm. by checking with DMV. Mm -hmm. So that, so that's how we came up with the software that just says, if I have a driver's license, it'll be uh, acknowledged as ID and uh, and so the person is registered to vote. It does, it has no effect. Mm. Well, tell me something. You mentioned early on that um, uh, people would just uh, maybe uh, uh, visas, if you will, for a certain a limited amount of time, and just mm -hmm. I mean, maybe a work permit or something. This and they are the driver's license in different colors or something like that. No, they're they, they're just like yours and mine. That it's just the expiration date it is not for the wow. same amount of time. What about the date? Do they have that list from the standpoint? Um, this is only good until such and such a date. I believe it says that. Okay, so, so once. But it, it just says it's just their expiration date. 
You know, we were talking about, in all due respect, the whole, there's a big issue about the illegal immigration uh, across the board aspect of it. And they were estimating something like 40 million or so or better, whatever. I mean, so we got the, the whole issue with our adjoining country, uh, Mexico, you know, 10 or, 11, the, the 10 or 12 million. But some say it's still running around about 30, 40 million. But the whole idea, these are people that are basically just, boom, just didn't, didn't report back, if you will. Right. And um, so you ask yourself the question, how can they still be here if, in fact, they've got it, they've got this ID? Well, in California, you have again? a half a billion people that just got driver's license that or that were just applying for driver's license, and they were not they were they're they're allowing illegal aliens right. in California to get these drivers to license. get the license, and they can vote. Well, they're not supposed to. They'll have to say I'm a citizen when, in fact, they're not. But nobody's checking. Jesus Christ! Well, we we have a problem. We do. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, a very there is an interesting a couple of things that you might like to know. The Pew Research Foundation, uh, it's not known as being a very conservative um, uh, 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 organization, but they say one in eight voter registration uh, records is inaccurate. One in eight. One in eight. And so that's not well, who's responsible is that uh, in all, the from Secretary the government of standpoint. State Secretary is, of State uh -huh. is not doing the job. Right. And so uh, the, I would just like to point out that in 2000, uh, the, the demographics for Portland showed that um, just in, in, in this area, there were 200, 190 foreign-born, um, well, let's see, they said 289, uh, not a citizen, 192,000 people in just this area. Are not citizens, so are not citizens. Are not. How do you figure? Are, are claiming that they're not citizens. So, if there's an illegal group, uh, th these are people that are just here as you know permanent residents, or but they're not citizens currently. So they're not voting. Right. They're not. They're, they shouldn't be voting. Uh, but yeah, there's a flaw in the system. But they could. There's vote. a flaw in the system that nobody's checking. So uh, I, there, there we have potential people that could be registering and I'm just saying we need to make sure that people know that they if they're not citizens they should not be registering to vote and we found that um, so people would be registered in more than one state so that's one of the problems that the Pew Research Organization pointed out so there is an interstate cross check um, uh, check that's done by Kansas mm -hmm. to try to find out if if people are registered in more than one state and mm -hmm. if they're voting in both states and Oregon participated in 2013 and then they dropped out hmm. and if you'll notice that none of the surrounding states were checking either and California by in fact has 38 million people in it and they don't even have a statewide voter database every one of their counties is a separate voter database so nobody's checking California with anywhere else in the state and would you know it even in this study it showed that Oregon and, and Arizona had some uh, 18,000 people in common because there's a lot of snowbirds going yeah, back right, and right, forth. Right, right, right. So, and Colorado and Oregon had great numbers. In well, fact, California got a major problem with illegal immigration. Right. That's so, huge. So, there's no checking here. And if Oregon matches with 100, and I think it was, let me see, Oregon 100 and. Uh, 115,565 people mm -hmm. in common. Hmm. So our, our Kate Brown got the information and she knows uh, it, Kansas told her which people were registered in both states. And what she did? I don't know. I yeah. don't know what she did. Um, and I also checked um, with the um, uh, with the Social Security Administration for dead voters, right. for for dead people, right. and we came back and we found that not over 900 people were still registered that were voter that were uh, dead, matched the Social Security master death list, and in fact, I, I at the most conservative possible means, I still came up with two people that that had voted after they died, hmm. and there were. 360 of them that had had voting records for longer than 19 years and they're supposed to be kicked out after five years if they haven't voted so apparently some of those have voted in some elections and and while that may not be a huge number there should be a way to make sure that dead people are not voting and I don't even think did you hear about the two people that I I absolutely had a death certificate really? 
and turned that into the Secretary of State. Did that make the news anywhere? None. I, no, it didn't. So I, I've been pretty frustrated. Well, you know, that is, that is the frustration, all due respect, of the of the voters out here now, mm -hmm. the, the legitimate ones, you know, and the taxpayers. Right. Because we're paying for these high-tech systems, if you will, mm -hmm. and being told that these high, we, we're so progressive today in high-tech that this would never happen. What, 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 mm -hmm. What's... How'd you come in with all this? <laughs> well, I, I also found out this is what a voter registration card looks like okay. from Mexico. Mm -hmm. This is it right here. I think they can see that. Okay, so that's a Mexican voter registration card. And if you look on the back of it, mm -hmm. you'll see that it has quite a bit of demographic and some wow. uh, biomet. With the photo and everything else? Right. And so the, those people, um, the their voter registration has to be done six months in advance and the, the voter registration officer comes to your house to register you to vote and you have to vote in a local precinct of only 750 people you have to be able to walk to the uh, voting booth right. to get there so they make sure so when people say people from uh, uh, you know are, are not used to this this is the most reliable ID in Mexico it's, it's preferred wow. and so uh, to say people can't do it I just I go they, the people in Mexico, they look at our voter registration cards and they giggle. They go, and how do you know it's not fraud? They just think it's absurd that we have such lax wow. in our, our system. Uh, again, Maryland just found there were 40,000 people that were uh, non-citizens. Uh, non um, this is a, an email I got from uh, the local county clerk said that um, uh, for voting overseas, that mm -hmm. that they're excluded from the HAVA laws. Um, this what, is, what was that HAVA law again? What, what is that? What, so that's the Help America it? Vote Act that says that you have to have something in order to register to vote, a bank statement, a utility bill, your driver's license, something. Um, and so all of the military uh, overseas votes are excluded from having to prove anything. Well, who, uh, benefit, I, who benefits from that? Well... Uh, I mean, you think about it, you know, there's got to be a beneficiary because it's about the money, you know. Well, in our day and age, when we have enemies abroad that want to hurt us, they could vote, help vote in people that would hurt us. Wow. And, and so that really is a concern. We don't want people from anywhere in the world to be able to take away your vote or my vote because they just decided to send in. We, we don't have any, we don't know if there's a real person or not. Could be a you know, whatever. Well, it's quite obvious that that's one of the reasons why the, the, the voting publics today are uh, uh, basically looking at this whole presidential election thing. It just happens to be the Republican thing at this point in time. And the D's, they're looking for outsiders. It's really a sad note. I mean, the, the people are frustrated. They are. It's irritating. Most everybody vote that, doesn't count. Yeah, most everybody that I talk to uh, is, gets pretty upset about this as well. This actually, any kind of voter ID has at least... 70 percent uh backing by the american people mm -hmm. as some areas in the more conservative areas it goes up to 87 percent mm -hmm. people really want to know their vote counts and in fact in states that have implemented voter id laws their voting rates go up and as the um uh, I think it was Pew, I'm not, I don't remember which organization showed, uh, pointed out, the reason people don't vote, it's not because th they aren't registered to vote. Mm -hmm. They don't vote because they're not interested in the candidates or the system they've mm -hmm. given up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what we are now. Yeah. And so if you don't think your vote counts and if somebody else is going to cancel it out from a different country, mm -hmm. why should I go yeah. spend the time to read all the information and yeah. decide who's going to be the best leader? Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I don't care. Wow, wow. Well, I, I take it then this petition, this initiative, this petition is going to correct a lot of things. You well, it, it, right. It's a start so, in the right direction. Right. So you'll see on there, if you look on the, on the, on the law that's put in there on, mm -hmm. on that second mm -hmm. page. Yeah, right here. This is the one right here. Uh -huh. Proof of qualifications. So then the person has to have, there's 10 good sources. Uh, there's been What's lots. Your name? Let's, let's go right down the, down okay. the line there. So uh, we chose these things because there were lawsuits. Uh, pe different people had felt disenfranchised. Okay. So we, we went through uh, the United States uh, birth certificate, your passport, your naturalization papers are the most um, authentic, authenticating uh, documents you can have for citizenship. But mm -hmm. we also included um, uh, other certificates uh, from you know, that people would get if you're born outside of the United States. Um, uh, uh, 
uh, Native Americans uh, certification. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's see, uh, confirmation of birth in the, uh, from the state of Oregon's records. Okay. Um, Indian tribe card. Um, uh, uh, recognized by the Homeland Security. Okay. Your adoption papers, if if they de were decreed that we were place. born in the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, an extract from the United States hospital record of your birth certificate, mm -hmm. certificate near the time of your birth. And if you don't have any of these 10 documents, you can petition for the INS uh, uh, and ask them to verify that you're a citizen. Mm -hmm. And if they don't respond, because sometimes they don't respond, mm -hmm. if all else fails, you can have a hearing before the Secretary of State and present whatever you have that shows you're a citizen. That's our last uh, place. So there's nobody. If you if you're if the hospital burned up where you were, the state doesn't have your birth certificate. Uh, whatever mean whatever is wrong with your part. But if you're a citizen, mm -hmm. we want you to be able to have time to show that and right. demonstrate it. And you can show whatever you have. Hmm. And if the secretary deems that it's as, at least as reliable as one of these other things, then mm -hmm. she can deem that you're that it's acceptable for mm -hmm. you to be registered here. And also, if you don't have a birth certificate in Oregon, you were born in Oregon, one will be provided for you for free. Hmm. If you if you p ask for it for purposes of voting uh, registering to vote so we've tried this will be a benefit to people hmm. and then our voter rolls will be more accurate and and um provide a good election for all of us mm -hmm. you know i was just thinking about what you were just talking about thinking about those individuals who in all due respect on this whole issue and they've been using the word uh, uh, the illegal immigration aspect of it, the anchor baby or something like that. I don't want to use that term, but but, but ba basically that's what I'm talking to right now. The fact of the matter is a person, a mother comes in and gives birth to a child who's illegal, right? And then they leave. Well, now who goes through the certification process that the person is an American citizen? Who registered that? The hospitals? Usually the it's hospital. Is, I, I don't know that part then, of it, I know, but I know down in Arizona there's an awful the lot. Hospital, the hospital aspect of it. Then after they after they leave the hospital, where does the baby go? I mean, the, well, I think the parents usually stay here with the baby and petition to become citizens because their child's an American. Yeah, but, but it's against the law. Well, I I'm, mean, I'm not trying to. Yeah, we want. But anyway, I, 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 you just got me into another arena. I mean, th that's a very serious situation right now. We are discussing it. And I think yeah. we should discuss it. Right. You know, you got me. But well, this is something that hopefully will help the situation out right here. Now, how, do you, how does one access to help you out on this? Well, do you right have now, the necessary we've, number got, we've gotten just about our our first thousand uh, signatures, so we'll be turning that in and for ballot title. Okay. And how, many, how, many, how, many, how many names do you need? How many, how many you need? Well, overall, we're going to need about 118,000 because it's a constitutional thousand. amendment. Okay. But I imagine it'll be tied up in the courts because some people won't want this wow. to happen. And we may not be able to start until... January or so. I don't know when we'll, they could give it right back to us, and we start pretty soon. But if it's if it's contested at all, then we'll have to wait until it gets through the court. Tell me this: what 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 kind of people? You've already laid it out to me that uh, government elected officials don't want it, and many of them don't. But what what kind of a mindset? What, what are the benefits of those folks who are not wanting this? Well, they're saying that we're discriminating uh, because we're requiring something of somebody in order to register to vote and they said there shouldn't be anything that disqualifies you from registering to vote because it's a fundamental right but it's a fundamental right to own a gun but they sure make sure that you have all your yeah, pay, 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 id pay, pay, to pay. get that done and it's a and mexico you're saying on the other hand yeah mexico, mexico is saying ain't nowhere in the world you're going to vote unless you got that id six months ahead of time six months ahead of time yeah and you have to do, redo it every 10 years wow wow you got to come up. And ours will take 10 years to get in, in all fully implemented. Uh, so. Well, what can they do to help you at this point in time? Well, where can, where can they one... could get a hold of me. I'm Janice at Oregonians okay. for Fair Elections. Oregonians for Fair Elections, okay. Uh, dot com. And I'm going to be looking for people to help me get the ballot initiative circulated mm -hmm. once we are approved for, mm -hmm. for general circulation. So okay. that's. Uh, Is there a phone number you might be able to share? You don't, you don't get your. Sure, I'm I'm five zero three seven five seven zero six seven zero. I'm not afraid to give my phone 503 number. Five zero three again was it? Seven five seven 
0670. Okay, fine. Is there any, once this thing gets through, I guess once it gets through, uh, where were the petitions? Can they again call you and you can get a copy mm -hmm. of this petition? Can okay. they go online? You're going to, yeah, we'll have, have we, we don't have a, our website up but, uh, right now, it's under construction, but it's Oregonians for Fair Elections.com. Okay. okay, that sounds good. That sounds good. Well, I wish you all luck in the world because, in all due respect, this is an issue. It and, is. Uh, I wish it, would, it was part of the, the presidential election at this point in time, but when we get people like, uh, but if we can make this issue stick, if you will. Well, the legislature could always take this initiative up and pass it right away. Wow, really? <laughs> but I I don't know that our current legislature would do that, but it, I would welcome it mm. if enough people wanted to get their their legislators to move on it. We, let's go for but it. But what about, I mean, I realize the, the Republicans are sort of a minority situation. Have they presented it? No. They haven't presented it. So I, I would welcome anybody to present it. Anybody. This is not a Republican or Democrat right. issue. This I is all this of is a, us. Yeah, this is, yeah this is, it's a people's issue. It's a, it's a <laughs> right. This is our election. Do we wow. want our vote being diluted with non-citizens uh, voting? Uh, it's a very serious situation. Well, gee, Janice, I mean, that's quite information. It's quite a task. Uh, I'm sure we, as, as a voter, I want to thank you very much for getting into this deal because we got a very important election coming up, the presidential we election. we got a gubernatorial election. So we're in a very serious situation right now. And so if something like this hopefully will get passed and so we can kind of get down to the point of getting very responsible folks who are citizens of this country. Right. And, and the, and the well, idea Thank you for is, having me on today. Well, hey, I appreciate we, it. We really appreciate you being here with us, and we want to thank you very much for doing that. Thank okay, you. Okay, it's always a pleasure. Pleasure. Okay, Janice. Too. Okay, good. So maybe what we'll do, we'll talk about some other issues at some point in time. Uh, Nathan, I'm very interested in the whole issue of Planned Parenthood, and, and I know you've been very much involved in the Right to Life group aspect of it, mm -hmm. so I'll have you back, okay? That'd be great. Okay, again, take care and have a good one. Thank you. You just sit down right where you are. Folks, thank you very much. I'll see you next week. Have a good one. Take care.